Good evening and welcome to Alaska TV Weather. I'm meteorologist Amanda Bowen. As a reminder, you can get a hold of us in many ways anytime you need a forecast by phone at 1-800-472-0391, online at weather.gov slash Alaska. And if you have any feedback or comments for us or questions, please feel free to email us anytime at nws.ar.tvweather at noaa.gov. I actually don't have any watches, warnings, or advisories in effect for today or the next day or so, so we'll skip right ahead to the breakup map. The big story today is generally the rivers are open south of the Brooks Range, so we're still waiting on those rivers on the north slope to open up for the Colville River at Umiat. We're looking at an average breakup date of about May 25th. So looking at that maybe in the next week or so, and then further north right along the North Shore at Colville Village on the Colville River, the average breakup date is June 3rd. So still another couple of weeks before we're expected to see open water there. We are seeing some high water on the Porcupine River near Fort Yukon today. So if you're in that area, keep an eye out. The river's running around bank full and is expected to stay that way through today at least and maybe a little bit into tomorrow. Taking a look at our satellite imagery for today, we are looking at a number of different things. We have fog, as we can see in those, those gray areas along the north slope uh, north of the Brooks Range. And then if we look out into the Aleutians, we can see a front coming through into the Aleutians, as well as another system bringing clouds and maybe some showers into South Central and into the Panhandle. Looking at today's weather, we've got low pressure over the western Aleutians. That's bringing an occluded front into the Aleutians with rain over pretty much the entirety of the Aleutian Islands. Also, a weak low pressure system over the western, southwestern portions of the state, about 1,003 millibars there, with a trough stretching both south of that low across the Alaska Peninsula and even Kenai Peninsula to some extent, and another trough stretching north of that low up along the northwest coast. That's actually going to be bringing some breezy conditions to the Chukchi Sea coast uh, today and a little bit into tonight. Showers associated with that low pressure system over southwest, and those showers are going to be stretching through south central and through the entire panhandle today. For tonight, we have that low pressure system in the Western Aleutians still with that occluded front starting to break up a little bit. So we'll see mostly showers for the Aleutians with some rain for the Southern Panhandle tonight. Low pressure weakening over Southwest Alaska. So just a few showers in that area. We do expect to see fog developing for the YK Delta as well as the Alaska Peninsula tonight. Also fog along the North Slope with some snow showers possibly. And then with those breezy winds along the Chukchi Sea coast, we may see some freezing, heavy freezing spray over the Chukchi Sea tonight. Also a weak low pressure system in the Northern Gulf tonight, bringing some showers into the Panhandle. For Wednesday, still have that low pressure system hanging out in the Aleutians. Weakening though at this point, so rain and showers for the Aleutians. Showers also moving into the YK Delta area with that low pressure system there. Could see even some heavy rain actually along the Alaska Peninsula for Wednesday. And then rain and showers also for the Alaska Panhandle on Wednesday. One thing that we're seeing is the possibility for freezing fog for the North Slope on Wednesday. So keep an eye out for that. It can cause very slick conditions, almost like freezing rain. Those droplets just being a little bit finer with the fog. 
For Thursday's weather, low pressure still weakening in the Aleutians, bringing plenty of shower activity all the way from the Aleutians into southwestern Alaska with rain across south central on Thursday. That trough along the northwest coast remains present, bringing some sh rain showers to the northwest coast and mostly dry for the panhandle on Thursday. For temperatures, Wednesday morning, we are looking at lows in the 20s, around 20 to low 20s for the North Slope area, north of the Brooks Range. That's certainly gonna be where we see our coldest temperatures for the state on Wednesday morning. Plenty warmer for the YK Delta area with temperatures in the mid to upper 30s right along the coast and low to mid 40s a little bit further inland up the Yukon and Kuskokwim rivers. Mid to low 40s for south central on Wednesday morning, upper 30s for much of the Aleutians and mid 40s for the for the peninsula, I'm sorry, the panhandle that is on Wednesday morning. High temperatures tomorrow afternoon, Wednesday afternoon, that is, we'll see 50s for the panhandle, low to mid 40s for the Aleutians. Looks like some mid 50s to even some upper 50s for South Central, so pretty similar to today there. And then upper 50s to around 60 degrees for much of the Yukon River area, stretching all the way from the Delta inland to about Fairbanks. Our coldest temperatures remain along the North Slope with temperatures in the upper 20s for highs on Wednesday afternoon. Thursday morning, still cold uh, for the North Slope. Temperatures around 20 to mid 20s, so a couple of degrees warmer than Wednesday morning for Thursday. Looking south of the Brooks Range into the Yukon Flats, low 40s mid 40s for uh, parts of the Yukon Delta and mid 30s to around 40 right there along the southwest coast. Looks like pretty similar for the Aleutians, upper 30s there and low 40s to mid 40s for south central. Looking into Thursday afternoon, we do see some changes from Wednesday. Uh, North Slope remains cold, a couple of degrees warmer than Wednesday afternoon though. So temperatures in the upper 20s to even low 30s. And then for the western coast of the state, we do expect to see a little bit cooler temperatures ranging from the low 40s to around 50 degrees instead of into the 50s for Thursday afternoon. On the opposite side though, we'll see warming further inland for mainland Alaska, north of the Alaska range, where we'll see 60s mostly, even 65 degrees in some locations. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. Moving on to aviation weather, taking a look at flying weather for Wednesday morning, we'll see IFR conditions along the North Slope, as well as along the Bristol Bay Coast and through much of the Aleutians, as well as a portion of the Northern Gulf for Wednesday morning. Wednesday afternoon, some improvement along the North Slope to marginal conditions, also improvement along the Bristol Bay Coast to marginal conditions. IFR still for most of the YK Delta, the immediate coastal portions, as well as IFR along the Aleutians and in portions of the Northern Gulf again. Marginal conditions for the immediate Panhandle Coast, stretching all the way up to the immediate uh, eastern portions of the Kenai Peninsula. For Thursday morning, IFR conditions returning to the North Slope, as well as western portions of the Seward Peninsula, stretching south through the coastal YK Delta. Also, IFR conditions for much of the Aleutians, as well as from the Kodiak Island area, stretching along the Gulf Coast through the eastern portions of the Kenai Peninsula and over to about Yakutat in the Panhandle. For Thursday afternoon, improvement in a number of places, including along the North Slope, where we'll see improvement to VFR or some marginal conditions along the immediate coast. IFR remaining along the immediate west coast of the state with marginal conditions along most of the Seward Peninsula and parts of the YK Delta. 
IFR conditions sticking around for the eastern Alaska Peninsula and the eastern Kenai Peninsula into the northern Gulf, as well as for the southern Alaska Peninsula and into parts of the Aleutians for Thursday afternoon. Pass conditions on Wednesday, Anaktuvik Pass VFR all day, but we will see some marginal conditions in the morning along the north entrance. Same story at Adigan Pass VFR, but MVFR on the north entrance during the morning hours. Lake Clark Pass on Wednesday, marginal improving to VFR in the afternoon. Merrill Pass should be VFR all day on Wednesday. Rainy Pass VFR on Wednesday, Windy Pass starting out marginal conditions Wednesday morning and improving to VFR Wednesday afternoon. Isabel Pass MVFR in the morning, improving to VFR in the afternoon. But with that clearing on Wednesday afternoon, we'll see a chance for some thunderstorms near Isabel Pass. Same thing at Mentasta Pass, MVFR improving to VFR in the afternoon, but bringing a chance of some thunderstorms Wednesday afternoon. Tanita Pass VFR all day. Portage Pass MVFR in the morning, improving to VFR Wednesday afternoon. Chilkoot and White Passes both MVFR in the morning, improving to VFR in the afternoon. Taking a look at freezing levels, we've got lots of warm air across the entire state with that 2,000 foot freezing level stretching north all the way to the north slope, even 4,000 feet stretching to portions of the north slope and across the eastern Brooks range. About 6,000 feet on the north side of the Panhandle with 8,000 feet on the south side of the Panhandle for Wednesday morning. Icing, quite a lot of isolated moderate icing over most of the state with the exception of the North Slope. So isolated moderate above 8,000 feet for the Aleutians, above 6,000 feet for much of the mainland and above 8,000 feet for the Panhandle. Also see considerable moderate for much of the Alaska Peninsula above 5,000 feet on Wednesday. Jet stream winds, we've got our main low just north of the Aleutians with our main jet just south of the Aleutians. That's going to be out of the west at 100 to 125 knots. A couple of smaller jet streaks across the area, one out of the south along the southern end of the Alaska Peninsula, 90 to 95 knots, and another one over the northern gulf out of the northwest, 90 to 95 knots also there. 9,000 foot winds low, pretty much in the same place, just north of the Aleutians, with our main winds south of the Aleutians out of the west, 50 to 55 knots. Another streak over the Alaska Peninsula out of the south, 55 to 65 knots. Not much of the way in the way of winds to talk about for the mainland or the Alaska Panhandle, but 40 to 45 knots out of the west and northwest over portions of the Gulf of Alaska. 3,000 foot winds, again, we've got that low just north of the Aleutians with our main winds just south of the Aleutians out of the west and a little bit of southwest, 50 to 55 knots. Another 50 to 55 knot jet streak out of the south for the southern portion of the Alaska Peninsula. And then still light winds over the mainland at 3,000 feet, 5 to 10 knots mostly, but some 20 to 25 knots over portions of the north slope and about five to ten knots over the panhandle turbulence just one spot of considerable moderate over much of the alaska peninsula below four thousand feet When you think of a national park, you probably envision wide open natural spaces undisturbed by human activity. There are indeed such places, but even in some of the most remote areas of a place like Kenai Fjords National Park in Alaska, the mark of man is present. Marine debris is a menace to the farthest reaches of our globe, and even designated national park lands are not immune. In the summer of 2009, the Resurrection Bay Conservation Alliance, a grassroots conservation organization based in Seward, Alaska, decided to do something about the marine debris fouling the beaches of Kenai Fjords National Park. Marine Debris Coordinator Tim Johnson had first-hand experience with the issue. The summer before, uh, my wife and I, Michelle, had done a paddle from Seward, a uh, sea kayak paddle from Seward to Homer. Really, our eyes were open to some areas that we didn't realize there was so much accumulation. It was very deceiving up front. You couldn't really get a feel for the, the extent and impact of it. You've got this, this, this nice high tide line that's 
quite pristine and you really don't get a picture for the, the impact, the amount of uh, debris in that area until you get behind those storm berms, you get back into the lagoons and the, the vegetation around those lagoons. And then you see the, the absolute extent back into that veg and how intertwined and enmeshed um, these decades of trash deposition. So we were just appalled by that and said we, we got to get something together on a larger scale. The Resurrection Bay Conservation Alliance is a local um, nonprofit community organization and they have been instrumental in helping um, the Park Service obtain funding to, to get uh, a boats, larger boats to help move the debris and they get volunteer labor and organize the work trips and so it's really a partnership between the Park Service and the community to help get out and really get a project done that in and of itself any one group couldn't do it on their own. Most of that trash was baggable, however, there were large items, huge, you know, piles of hauser line, uh, for example, that, you know, we just had to hoist up onto the boat. The volunteers didn't just bag, haul, and hoist the garbage, but also carefully recorded what types of debris were collected. In many ways, the debris itself is a resource. Um, archaeologists use middens, the trash heaps, um, as a way of analyzing past cultures, and in one sense, Marine debris is a form of a midden. It's a trash heap that left for the future would be something that people could use to analyze our cu culture. It may not say the best things about our culture or the, everything that we want, but we need to be able to document what we've done um, so that we can preserve that legacy, um, make sure that we as a society don't forget what we've, what we've been doing. We had two larger categories of, of, of marine debris that we picked up. Um, commercial fishing um, means like, um, say, uh, gill nets, um, large hauser lines, anything that, that would be associated with more of a commercial fishing scale. And then the second category was, was more recreational fishing and household, you know, which would be you know, general plastics, um, you know, things like that. Um, so we had about a 75% of the commercial fishing uh, marine debris element and about 25% of the recreational and household further out the bay, and we had the exact opposite the closer we got to Seward uh, within the bay. It was about 25% commercial uh, fishing versus 75% recreational fishing and, and household. The trash is not just unsightly for park visitors, but also poses threats to wildlife and marine habitat. Really one of the larger issues now that you go to this plastic that has, uh, can really get into the food web and affect the food web differently than something like glass. These substances, for instance, all these polystyrene blocks that are breaking down into all these little crumbly bits are, are further breaking down on a microscopic level and uh, how much of an impact that has, you know, in this ecosystem is yet to be determined, but I think it's got pretty high potential. You know, well known the sea turtles will eat plastic bags floating in the water. They look like jellyfish to a sea turtle and um, obviously a plastic bag doesn't uh, go well in the digestive system of a turtle. 
Um, albatross will see small pieces of plastic floating on the surface and think they're small fish and other food sources and eat that in their stomachs, especially in some of the um, northwestern Hawaiian islands. It, they, they'll find dead albatross that have starved to death with a full stomach and it's full of pl pieces of plastic. We're affecting our local areas this way, uh, but we need to be thinking about it from more of a state and, and, and global international on scale. And, and most importantly, to, to try and focus on prevention of it coming in, in the first place. Because we're just going to see this continuing you know, to build up on our beaches unless we're able to, to get a little bit more of an approach on, on prevention on the front end. Marine debris is really a global problem um, you know, in all the oceans, and you know, there are many different sources. Global shipping is one. Fishing debris from commercial fishing, um, recreational boating activity, activity on land, stuff blowing off land, washing down streams, people just throwing stuff on the shore. Though the problem can seem overwhelming, Johnson remains upbeat about making a positive difference. No, you gotta, you gotta start local. You gotta, you know, take control of what you can do, and 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 make something with that, and and try and you know move on from there. Overall, more than nine tons of debris was removed from the beaches of Kenai Fjords National Park and transported back to Seward to be deposited in a landfill. People gave a lot to the project in order to make it happen. That was um, awesome. One of the most amazing experiences I've ever um, had. Be able to put that that large of a group of volunteers together, dedicated um, volunteers to put that much effort and, and give that much time and pull all these the different agencies together to see it all happen um, was, yeah, it was, it was incredible. It was really incredible. Yeah, very fulfilling um, experience. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Welcome back for a look at the marine forecast. Starting out looking at the sea ice, we see some changes today with uh, shorefast ice pretty much gone around the Yukon Delta area. Also shorefast ice breaking up in Norton Sound and near Nome with that shorefast ice near Nome pretty much gone and big portions of Norton Sound open at this point. Shifting to the rain forecast for southeast Alaska, light winds on Wednesday, just 5 to 10 knots, and seas also on the light side, 6 to 7 feet over the Gulf waters, and 2 feet for the inside waterways. Thursday's forecast, winds and seas coming up just a little bit, 10 to 20 knots for the Gulf waters of wind, and 6 to 8 feet seas for the inside waterways, still two foot seas and five to 10 knots of wind. For South Central on Wednesday, we'll see winds generally 10 to about 15 knots with some lighter winds over the northern parts of the Gulf, about five knots. 10 knots out of the north for Prince William Sound, and about 15 knots out of the south for Cook Inlet, sea is running five to seven feet for the Gulf, about two feet for Prince William Sound, and three feet for Cook Inlet on Wednesday. Winds and seas coming up just a little bit for Thursday, five to about nine feet over the Gulf, and about three feet over Cook Inlet for Thursday. We'll see strongest winds out of the southeast and east in that area between Kodiak Island and the Kenai Peninsula. We'll also see the highest seas there in the eight to nine foot range. For the Alaska Peninsula in Kodiak Island on Wednesday, lightest winds up near Kodiak Island, about 15 knots out of the southwest, increasing as we head south down the Alaska Peninsula to about 30 knots out of the southeast on the south end of the peninsula. Seas nine to about 13 feet on the Gulf side and five to seven feet on the north side of the Alaska Peninsula. Heading into Thursday, we'll see those winds generally increase a little bit, 20 to 25 knots out of the southeast near Kodiak Island. Strongest winds about 30 knots 
out of the southeast for Bristol Bay and 20 to 25 knots out of the south for the south end of the Alaska Peninsula. Seas 10 to 12 feet for the Gulf side and 5 to 6 feet for the north side of the peninsula. For the Aleutian Range, we'll see about 30 knots of wind out of the south, a little bit of southeast for most of the Aleutians. A little bit lighter wind as we head further west, 15 knots out of the northwest between Kiska and Adak, and then 35 knots out of the north or even a little bit northeast for the western Aleutians on Wednesday. Heading into Thursday, those winds coming down maybe just a little bit, 20 to about 30 knots generally out of the south and west across the board. Seas 14 to 17 feet for the Gulf side and about 7 to 9 feet for the north side of the Aleutian chain. Taking a look at the west coast, we'll see rather light winds in Norton Sound, 10 knots out of the south but stronger winds elsewhere, 25 to about 30 knots of wind generally out of the southeast and east with that 30 knots of wind in the open Bering Sea. Also seven to 10 feet of seas in the Bering and about two feet in Norton Sound on Wednesday. For Thursday, Winds pretty consistent, not a whole lot of change, 15 knots out of the east in Norton Sound and 20 to 30 knots further south. Seas also fairly consistent into Thursday, 7 to 10 feet, so coming down just a little bit in the Bering and about 3 feet in Norton Sound. For the Arctic coast, we've got 15 knots of wind out of the east for the north slope and about 15 to 25 knots out of the east and northeast for the west coast with 25 knots out of the northeast on the south side of the Bering Strait. Seas running in the three to five foot range along the northwest coast uh, away from the ice. Looking ahead into Thursday, winds increasing for the north slope, still out of the east, but 15 to 25 knots, and winds 15 to 25 knots also for the northwest coast out of the east and northeast. Seas two to four feet for the northwest coast on Thursday. Recapping what we're looking at for tonight, we've got low pressure moving showers into the Aleutians, as well as some showers for the Panhandle. Keep an eye out for heavy freezing spray on the Chukchi Coast. Thanks so much for watching Alaska TV Weather. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.